Patikrit Pain and uh, Dr. Swasti Rao is joining us. Dr. Rao, um, of course, the big uh, focus would be what will be the nature of the joint statement and if that comes out uh, actually at all. Uh, but uh, India certainly sending a message that India is the consensus builder and, and is hoping to really ensure that message gets communicated through a joint statement. That's right, Maria. And uh, we must remember, I've been following the debates that you are doing there. And so Hassani made a very, uh, some very valid points. And we must remember that the Ukraine war has truly unleashed an intersectional global moment for India's tradecraft. So uh, we have the credibility to emerge as the voice of the global south. We can harness our international posturing as a long-standing democracy, which is rooted in non-alignment. At the same time, you know, we have expanded our cooperation with the West and Russia. Uh, and Russia remains a friend and a partner as well. But having said that, uh, it, what is happening today in New Delhi is definitely a test for India's deft diplomatic pragmatism, more so because the last meeting, the finance ministers and the uh, you know heads of the central banks uh, that was held in Bengaluru, those, the differences came out and we were not able to reach a communique. And uh, I think somebody also mentioned that the purpose of having this uh, foreign ministers meeting is not to discuss the Ukraine war. The agenda is different. The agenda is more developmental. It is about how to uh, deal with uh, food and energy security, how to deal with global debt, uh, you know, Dr. a lot Sandira, of resilience you know, supply let's, chains. Let's focus yeah. on this very crucial bilateral which, which of uh, pictures of which would be coming to uh, our viewers very shortly. This is on India-China bilateral. External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jay Shankar hosting that bilateral and interacting with his Chinese counterpart. Of course, he is a new foreign minister. This is his first visit to India. But also this meeting coming in the backdrop of the first working group meeting, which happened on 22nd of February 2023, which was in-person meeting happening in Beijing. Right, Maria. See, uh, that is that is the beauty of all these grand multilateral, uh, uh, or you know, forums because they also give you the opportunity to engage bilaterally with so many of your friends and allies and also adversaries. So I think uh, what is important is that we must we must remember it's not just the G20, but India is also holding the presidency of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization simultaneously, where China is a member. Yes. I do not expect uh, you know any breakthrough um, or sort of a breakthrough to uh, to come on the LAC issue uh, per se, but as far as driving the agenda and about, you know, this entire um, responsibility that I think both India and China understand very well uh, with respect to what their, um, uh, you know, um, uh, participation in terms of global trade and all the climate uh, discourse, etc. I think at the same time, we understand that there's a lot riding on the big players' shoulders. And uh, I think these bilaterals also give a very good opportunity and space to sort of talk about that and address each other's concerns better, not just for the G20, but also for, uh, like I said, uh, the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the RIC mechanism, which is the Russia, India, China. Uh, so I think these are platforms where uh, we, we get a chance to address each other's concerns and which is a very valid way of how to go about not just convergences, but also divergences. Yes, and issues that cannot be resolved should be on the back burner issues that can be converged upon where consensus can be arrived at should be in the foreground is a message that is coming in. Padikrit, you know, even as the disengagement process continues at the LAC, the big visual opportunity or, or, or the big political message in terms of uh, optics certainly would be that India and China are meeting, that this is an in-person meeting which is happening right at the top. Maria, let me tell you one thing that, uh, you know, in spite of the face-off and challenges mm. and problems that India and China has, uh, it, it would never be a problem when it comes to developing a communicate, communicate uh, for any G20 uh, meeting. Secondly, they would not allow and they have never allowed that kind of a problem to escalate into a war. So I think in certain respect, India and China has shown much more maturity in terms of dealing this. And I think uh, the Indian... Uh, foreign minister had made it very clear on several occasions. Uh, but I think the bigger issue here is this. This uh, meeting and throughout this year, you would see these meetings would become a slanging match. And that is the reason South Korea and Japan did not send their foreign ministers, because they knew that European Union and United States would expect them to actually you know, fight and support their views, which uh, it, these countries are finding it very difficult to actually do beyond a point, because the sanctions culture is creating ma major problem in most of the countries 
uh, and not just Europe only. And that is what Prime Minister Modi has been pressing upon. I think for India, let me tell you, whether we come out with a communique or not, it would have no impact so far as the war is concerned. It would have no relevance. The war would only end yes. if and only if yes. United States and Europe understand. Prime Minister said, Prime Minister said, this is not the era of war at Samarkand, which was reiterated in Bali, which formed part of the joint statement. What changed from then to now where most countries have hardened their stand? Well, first of all, we have to understand that message was only not for Russia or Ukraine. It was also for the West, which has been responsible for many wars. This, yes. You know, the problem is this, and that is where United Nations reform is important. That's what Prime Minister is mentioning. That the conflict resolution mechanism of United Nations is a complete flop. From 1945 onwards, when United Nations was created till today, has UN been able to solve any or prevent any conflict? The answer is no. There have been innumerable wars where United Nations has remained a mute spectator. Secondly, when these sanctions come up and these arbitrary unilateral sanctions by the West, it impacts the developing countries more than it impacts anybody else. There are many countries which have a debt problem today because of this culture of sanctions which increase commodity prices like yes. anything. And of course, the culture of war which has huge impact mm on the supply chain aspect. So multilateral institutions must change. And this is what he's mentioning, that the conflict resolution mechanism of the United Nations must change to make sure that wars don't happen. Today, war has become an end objective. And unfortunately, there are these uh, deep-pocketed military industrial complexes which manipulate geopolitical situations to make sure wars happen because yes, it helps and them. And the point that and you that made where... about democratization of these institutions is what the Prime Minister has been insisting on and he has been talking about it in the context, context of India emerging as the voice of the Global South. Uh, Dr. Swasti